a Build Hatch developed production. Hello, I'm Aaron Kyle and welcome to another episode of Build Hatch. On this week's episode of Build Hatch, I got to sit down with Emily Armstrong, who is an architect in Melbourne doing great things in the construction space. On this week's episode, Emily and I spoke about covering the whole mix of construction, from concept to design and interiors, which Emily is extremely passionate about. I particularly love talking to Emily about the different perspectives of architecture, including the influencing that goes on behind the scenes, which is clearly working because Emily is doing some wonderful projects all around Melbourne. So let's get into it. Emily Armstrong from Emily Armstrong Architects. Welcome to Build Hatch. Thanks, Aaron. Um, nice to be on your podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming onto the show. I always love getting architects input and like all I guess, we always like to go back to the, the very beginning. So did you grow up here in Melbourne? I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. I've always lived in Melbourne, very different parts of Melbourne, different phases of my life. But yeah, I'm a Melbourne girl through and through. <laughs> What sort of student were you, Emily? Good one in high school, not a great one at university. <laughs> yeah, very academic in a, in high school, and then I don't know. I think the the relaxed <laughs> schedule at uni really agreed with me. So not as diligent at uni. Did you always want to be an architect? Like when you're at school, were you always thinking that you wanted to enrol to be to be an architect? Yeah, it's interesting. I. No, not until I hit year 12 and then, I don't know, sort of came across architecture as a suggested profession. I just locked into it and I was like, right, that's what I'm doing. So that really motivated me through year 12 to get into the degree. Just fell into it, as they say. Well, yeah, I think I've always been quite creative, just naturally quite creative. And um, But then at school I was quite good at the maths and sciences, so architecture was this really not what well, presented itself as this really nice combination of the two and I thought yep that's that sort of engages both um so yeah it was a bit of that too because I, I I wanted to do something creative one thing just led to another yeah so you studied here in Melbourne and what was university life like studying architecture um quite intense actually upon reflection it was um, I was quite lucky. I lived quite close to uni, so I had a nice little bubble in which I existed from home to uni. Yeah, it was it was demanding. So a lot of contact hours and and given it was, you know, had creative elements, but also had a very strong physics element to it. Um, it was quite a shock to kind of launch into that after school, expecting uni to be a bit more cash. Um, and a lot of my room do like who did it the smart way and did degrees that were not as intense in first year were having a great time, but I seemed to have to work a lot more. <laughs> in, yeah, intense is probably the best way to put it. Studying architecture is more on the arts side of study, isn't it? I mean, as obvious that, as that sounds, but from an academic point of view. Yeah, no, no, not not obvious at all. Um, it is because I guess your design studios take up the most amount of your time per semester uh, and they run for a long time. So you have design studios that go for three hours as opposed to a lecture goes for an hour sort of thing. So it's very much weighted towards the creative side of the course. Yeah, it was it, which was kind of a, a bit of a shock to the system actually having these big long studios and everyone a lot of students worked quite collaboratively in studio as well and I didn't I quite like working on my own so I was always the person leaving uni to work at home coming back in it was just just surprised me that it wasn't very practical that was probably the only thing about about the degree it didn't wasn't really about preparing you for the working world and about the practicalities of sort of running a practice and you know structuring your workflow and all that sort of thing that you have to think about when you get into the working world and I didn't like that so much <laughs> <laughs> so for anyone listening to this who's thinking well what does that entail like people see say a building or or a project and you know they just see bricks as mortar to to be cliche what actually goes on behind the scenes because 
as I said, it's very much al- along the art spectrum architecture, but like everyone I talk to who's an architect, there's an approach or that's a, an application and a, a process that applies to the actual project. Yeah, I, I've i always approached it as creative problem solving architecture. So every project I do is so different from the last one because the clients are completely different people. So I always go into it with this problem solving approach and it's for me almost a process of sort of unraveling the layers of my clients and their lives and then trying to translate that into spaces for them and then factoring in all sorts of things like budgets and their aesthetic while also trying to direct them quietly towards your aesthetic as well. But, yeah, that's that's how I see it behind the scenes. Now take us through, I guess, how you established Emily Armstrong Architects. How did that come about? So I didn't stay very long in my grad um, job. I did about three years with um, Techne Architects, which is a great firm, and I actually wanted to leave the profession. I left there thinking I was getting into food because I've always been quite a passionate um, cook and very, very much into food. That's Someone really interesting. Me. Yeah, it was, I, was, I was completely focused on doing that and I thought I'll do some architectural work on the side because I needed to obviously make a living. And a friend approached me to do some work for them and then a few other people and before I knew it, I was just into it, like all of a sudden doing all this work and I was really enjoying it in a way I hadn't before, I think, because it was, I was doing it in a way that made sense to me and meant something to me so so was it like a like a a bit more purpose I guess yeah I think um I think the thing that's interesting about a a creative profession or a design profession is that you need to be able to express yourself as a as someone creating something so when you are a young like a graduate in a someone else's company you obviously have to earn your stripes so you you don't get to do that as early on so for me it was just this really great way that I got to express who I was creatively Um, and it became really exciting and then all of a sudden I thought oh yeah no this is what I've this is what I've worked hard to to do this is what I've studied for so um, I should just give it a go and so I just decided to keep going and I'm still going. <laughs> so, <laughs> Stuck at it. Yeah. So, um, and I've loved, I've really loved the business side of architecture. I find it fascinating running a business and a part of the art whole architecture profession that I've fallen into and really clicked with. When you said that you were uh, wanting to get into sort of food, was it from a, a chef's perspective or was it from something else, a restaurant or? Uh, no, it was from I wanted to create products. I was actually going into breakfast cereals and I was looking at creating ones for just cereal alternatives for people who had um, like eating intolerances and allergies because um, around that time I found out I had some and there wasn't really much on the market and so I thought this is a bit of a um a niche that hasn't been explored yet and I kind of wanted to get into that spent a lot of time creating different breakfast cereals and I had all my packaging ready to go and um and I just yeah I just shelved it because I I just became too busy with the architectural side of things so yeah, so I'm known in my family as the mu- as the muesli person. I used to <laughs> used to make muesli for my family, um, test it out on them. So that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, it's really it's it's quite quite a departure from architecture, but um, I guess it's it was creative in its own way. So I guess producing food also has that economical element as well. You know, like just like a a chef or or a restaurant owner or someone who's interested in anything, you, you, you're producing a product, there's that economical element that needs to stack up as well. So the fundamentals, you know, are still the same. Yeah, it was, it was exciting too to think that you could 
create something and you know and sell it and it sort of was quicker you know architecture is such a long process um you know a lot of my clients I have for with me for working with me for two to three years on residential projects it was just yeah this realization too that I could do something that was quick that you know was tangible and and reaped rewards quite quickly so um something that kind of made me want to venture out to a different sort of business you mentioned about that relationship how does a typical brief start because it, do, it doesn't take five minutes to come you know from an initial inquiry it can be like you said two or three years before the project's mm-hmm. actually built in some cases it's an interesting one because you do formulate a brief but really you you design over a long time with your clients whether they realize that that that's what you're doing or not because they start to get their confidence in the process and start to realise what they do and don't want. Um, So it's the brief almost, um, you know, you start with your very practical, we want four bedrooms, one bathroom type of thing and we really like colour and we're these kind of people sort of thing but then and that's that kind of is a fundamental to get you started but then as you go back and forth and work together all these things come out and you almost just um refine everything as you go along and it takes months and months and months so um but the one of the biggest things that I always ask my clients to do is is put together images because I find most people find it very hard to express themselves when it comes to how they live and like what they want their space to look like um so yeah I work a lot with with my clients with imagery so they usually they build a book for me or they share things on Pinterest and it's um it really helps the dialogue and it helps you nut out exactly what they want what they want when sometimes they just don't have the words so yeah definitely COVID several years ago now and I guess going into 2023 is there like a particular trend or or pattern that's emerging with with architecture or is it more purpose sort of driven? No, I I find it more purpose driven. And maybe that's because most of my projects really, particularly the last few years, are private residences. People almost come to me, present me with all the problems of their current space and sort of how can you make our home this amazing place that we want it to be. Um, I will say that I do find, I am finding with clients they are a little bit bolder, which is really exciting. So um, I don't know where that comes from, whether COVID just allowed people to be in their spaces more and kind of really understand their homes. But I'm finding my clients are a little bit more confident and they're a little bit more um, willing to do things that are a bit different, which is great for me. Yeah, that's probably one big thing that I've noticed in the last few years. One of the great things I guess you're well known for as well is the interior side of the business as well. So is that something that you equally love doing more than architecture or is it kind of hand in hand? Um, I'm probably starting to love it a bit more than architecture. I Don't get me wrong, I love, I do love generally designing just anything really. But, but yeah, I, I like the, the finer detail that um, – that you can get into with interiors. So I do a lot of, you know, custom cabinetry and random stuff. Like I've created lighting for clients when we couldn't quite find something that was right and, you know, mixed my own paint colours. And, you know, I just love that whole idea that you can really change the space and really customise it to kind of suit what you've done with the general structure and and just working with different suppliers it's kind of the interiors industry is um is kind of fun you know like the 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 reps are really great and really enthusiastic and um you know you get into color and texture and all that sort of stuff in a different way so there's that element too that i really enjoy i think also too like you said we were talking earlier about being bold and clients are probably a bit more informed these days and they know what they want so it's kind of like 
you bringing home the finishing touches and you know i always love like do you find it fascinating when a client comes to you with a brief and they think they know what they want but then you kind of not manipulate because manipulate's <laughs> the wrong word but you can kind of massage this this extra yeah. element that they hadn't perhaps thought of before yeah absolutely and it takes a certain client to get on board with that but yeah i i abs- absolutely agree with that Erin. i think that's um a part of of the job that i think i really like that you can give people options like you just direct them to something they haven't thought of before and it's so nice when they love it and you know and they get on board and then when they see it at the end of the project it gives you such a nice feeling like I'm so glad that we you know we did that and they're so glad that they got on board with it type thing I think you really need to get into the process of designing your home before your brain kicks into that mode and starts to make you realize what you really do need and want in a space. Yeah, look, I, I love it. You know, it's that purposeful design. I mean, people that are lucky enough to have an architect design their their space or or an interior design, it allows one to appreciate the actual true purpose and the the little things that some people don't necessarily see every day because they're they're not actually living and functioning their life in inside that particular space. Mm, yeah, it's it's so true. I think it's the whole idea that someone can encourage you to see something from a different perspective, but also translate that sort of finish look that someone's looking for like really wanting to achieve but don't know how to and then you get to kind of put all the nuts and bolts together for them like it's a yeah I think it's a really special process actually it's probably one of the reasons that I like I you know like what I do so much and maybe why I've leaned into doing private residences because it's so personal and so emotional which can make it quite challenging sometimes but the same token there's nothing better than when someone walks into a space that you know you've designed with them and they just sort of they're just really happy with it and they think it feels really good and they still don't really know why but um but it's all those little tiny little finicky details and things that you get to think about on their behalf and then you put it all together and it's um yeah it's it's a really really nice very fulfilling thing to experience speaking of fulfilling experiences you're well known for your gray street residence in east melbourne fascinating project so for people listening to this tell us a little bit about that project the gray street project was a renovation to a heritage or a victorian terrace in east melbourne Um, and it had undergone quite a nasty renovation in sort of the 90s so if you can imagine this beautiful old building with all its original features and then it's just had this 90s reno stuck on the back of it it was just it was it was awful it was sort of low ceilings and you know weird cabinets to kind of conceal pipes that were put in weird spaces and you know my my client would just sort of said every time we walk into this space we just feel so sad (laughs) that someone kind of did this to the house so it was the old the heritage part of the house so it was beautiful and it kind of needed someone to come in and give it a new life but also redo that renovate that sort of addition out the back almost just to make it sort of seamlessly complement the older part of the house so it was really I don't know it was special because that was a particularly special client. They were really excited about the whole process and um, the wife of the couple um, particularly was quite involved, which was really nice. Like she sort of wanted to be part of sourcing things and learning all about it and she has great style, so that was kind of handy too. Um, So there was that, but they were really open to what I wanted to do in there. They really just gave me... It was it was almost carte they, blanche. Really. They trusted you. Um, yeah, they did. Yeah, and I think um, which is big because 
you know, it's your home and even though even though people engage architects and interior designers and designers to do their homes, it's still theirs. So it's very hard for people to um, to give that control over. But this couple were amazing like that. So I just enjoyed it so much because I, because they'd given me that trust, I think I almost, I was so motivated to make it like the best version of what they wanted ever um, and put so much probably so much time into doing things a bit differently. Um, so was so the brief was really like new. for the, the whole house like, or was it just that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, East Melbourne's pretty tricky, particularly with their, in terms of their um, town planning. So we couldn't sort of just add space to make it function better because it really didn't function. It functioned like an old Victorian, not like a like the house. A house needs to function now. So there was a great challenge in having very little space, very little scope to make more space. So I just sort of we just got in there and tweaked everything um, and kind of manipulated what was there. And um, yeah, and it was it, the, the brief was almost what do you think? Like, what do you think we need to do? And I just went in there and just sort of told them what I thought and they said, okay, great. And it turned out to be just basically gutting the whole house and, and starting again. So um, it was, I mean, apart from the heritage, keeping all the heritage features, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was quite a big project to not, not sort of bigger than I expected. How long does a project like that, where you're dealing with, the local council with, with heritage impacts and stuff like that. Like how long does that add to, to, a, to a project like this one? It's interesting. We were very lucky with council on that one because we decided, well, I decided not to push the boundaries too much um, just out of respect for the fact that, you know, it, everything in East Melbourne is quite tightly built. So, you know, you've got your neighbours very close by and, um, you've just got to consider all those sorts of things. So we didn't, I didn't push the boundaries. So we probably got through council in about three months, which is, which is pretty great. Yeah, that's Sometimes pretty quick for that be, kind of work. Yeah, I can't say. I mean, they usually say it's minimum is six months, even if it's something tiny. Um, so that was that was not as big a deal on that job, which was nice. And then I think from start to finish, we kind of got to building. From the initial design stage, we were building within maybe a year. It moved quite well, considering some of my clients are with me for two to three. So, That's right. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Now, what about builders listening to, to this and, and hearing your story and what's some of the standouts of this year, you know, being 2023, like we've obviously gone through a boom over the last couple of years and, and we're heading in a somewhat different direction a little bit it's hard to tell what what it'll be like over the next 12 months or so but like yeah what's your sort of insight into the construction industry from a, from an architect's perspective well I think the, the biggest thing has been that costs have increased dramatically and it was I hadn't tended a lot of jobs in sort of the last few years I was in design stages and drafting so I di- didn't really become so apparent to me until I renovated my own house, which I did quite recently, and I couldn't believe it, just ha- how inflation had affected the industry so much, but also to how busy the industry is. I mean, I've I've always had the experience that builders and the building companies that I work for, or, or that I work with, sorry, are... Uh, are always seem consistently busy um, and I'm always mindful of, you know, asking them to tender quite well in advance and that sort of thing just so they're available. Um, and there's always been the odd site where, <clears throat> excuse me, a trade, you know, can't come because there's, they're so busy and all this sort of stuff, but it, it just seems like that's amped up again um, and that, the, that there just aren't that many available um, contractors and tradespeople. And it just, um, yeah, and, and I think the most recent tender that I did, that was, they were the two things, just the seeing that the cost of things and just the timing of things just blows my mind. But I guess, 
but yeah, for me, they're the, the two standouts. I haven't experienced a lot of delays with materials and things like that. I've been quite lucky and suppliers have still been pretty efficient. So it's very process driven. So I always say this all the time that leaders will lead and, you know, the, the way the industry's changed and the, the impacts and, and, you know, whether it's materials or, or labor, it's very much about, you just need to make it happen. <laughs> there's no, yeah. there's no, you know, dressing it up or dressing it down or blaming people or delivery drivers. It's just, it's just making it happen. It's yeah. It's all and you it's can do. Been, yeah. And it's been interesting to work. I mean, I work with amazing builders. I have to say it, it's taken a lot of years to kind of work out who to work with, like, or who I work with well. And I have to say that the, the builders that I work with now, they're, yeah, they're, they're great. They're um, in all respects, even more so in the, during the pandemic and, and now going forward from that um, time, you are very aware of the people that are super efficient and can just get stuff done. You know, like it, there are obviously issues that have are still coming out of COVID, um, but there are just the builders and tradespeople that are just really switched on um, have sort of become more of a standout now to me. Um, and they, you know, and even some of the suppliers that I work with, their ability just to to get it done, like you said, um, is amazing. And some will use the excuse and some will just, yeah, they'll get it done or they're just, they'll just they just communicate really well so that, you know, you can then communicate well to your clients and there isn't that issue of, you know, we're one day out from needing something and it hasn't arrived on site or, you know, the build's going to go over by three months and no one's prepared. Like I think a lot of particularly a lot of builds that, that I work with have, have their communication on that front is is fantastic. and makes it all manageable really certainly when emily armstrong's not busy working on some really <laughs> cool projects around melbourne what does what does emily like to do outside of work ah uh, oh god i do work a lot <laughs> um uh, i'm very big into health and fitness i still am very into food and love cooking but i'm i'm a runner and do a lot of yoga and and that keeps me you know, is a nice balance from all the, the desk time. Um, otherwise, I travel when I can. I haven't travelled for a long time, which feels very strange. But yeah, um, I love absolutely love travel when I can when I can do it. That would kind of be yeah, that would be it. They'd be the main things I think. For the people listening to this who want to reach out or or contact Emily and and uh, have you involved in their their amazing project, what what's the best way to go about it? email I think <laughs> just shoot me an email and then usually I will from there meet with a potential new client and have a face-to-face because I really think that you have to click because it's a it's a big thing to to build and renovate and you are working together for a long time yeah, more than a lot of relationships I often say yeah <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's yeah, that's very true. And just um, yeah, you you very much have to get to know each other. Like you you can't design a house for someone without um, without really understanding you about how they how they work. So quite personal. So you've got to get along. <laughs> Definitely. What's on the the cards moving forward for Emily Armstrong Architects? That's a really interesting question, Aaron, because I'm, but yeah, I don't know. I think, well, like I mentioned to you, the last project that I did was a bit more of an interiors project, which was out of the ordinary for me. And it was great because it was a little bit shorter, a project and kind of all the fun interior detail stuff that I love. So I'm, I'm wondering if I might sort of steer a bit more in the interiors direction as well. Is that- as- easier or or harder or like what what's unique about the interior side of things there's fewer obstacles in terms of permits and approvals and things when you're working with the interior of a space you don't really have to be 
I mean, there are always exceptions, but most of the time you're free to do your thing without having to go to council and, and without building permits being a massive thing to undertake. So there's a simplicity about it from that perspective, which is really nice because it means you you get things going quickly and you move through the process really quickly. So you sort of, you don't lose your, your rhythm, which you kind of sometimes can on jobs that are held up by permit processes and things like that. So you tend to also have a really nice um, flow with your clients as well. Like this job just sort of you know, went like bang, 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 just just flew along in a really nice way. Well, at least you can get stuck into it. Like like you said, you don't yeah. have to wait for town planning. Do you have like a, a favourite product or like a designer or, or style that you're just loving at the moment? I do love Kelly Wurstler's stuff, um, the, the designer, interior designer in the US. Um, she does some really outrageous, well, I say outrageous, but I probably shouldn't. I'll say outrageous things and I... I like her her boldness in terms of the work that she does. Is that like a like a style or like products? She does both. So she does interiors, but she oh, and she sort of found her feet doing interiors in the hospitality sector, so in restaurants and hotels and things. But she does also design and and um, sell her own products, so um, furniture and all those sorts of bits and pieces. So she's quite. She's got sort of a few fingers in different pies and um and she's just got a great personal style like the way she presents herself and all that sort of thing it's like she's she really wears her brand I read so much um about new products and designers and I just I love keeping keeping in touch with what's going on in all in particularly in different areas of different different parts of the world like just seeing how different designers do things is just is really interesting and it funnily enough I feel like whether we realize it or not everything that we look at even in our day-to-day particularly if we're looking at a cool magazine or at a designer's work from somewhere else um, it really does influence you in your own work yeah it's hard to pinpoint one or two things, but I just like to sort of just keep on, keep on track with what's happening, particularly with all that products. I've got a real thing about lighting. I think it's one of the most underestimated elements of a of a project. And I think lighting just does incredible things um, people don't realise. So I'm constantly trying to find interesting new lighting, um, and I tend to gravitate towards the US for that a lot of the time but yeah so lighting is always a product that I'm pretty passionate about <laughs> yeah there's there's so much to think about you could actually you know I kind of lose time sometimes when I'm in a project like <laughs> just you know it's uh, you you start thinking about everything from the from the cladding on the exterior to you know the handles on the on the doors and inside the house and um you can really get quite lost in it because it's it's just so much to think about and it is all so important you know in terms of how the overall space feels emily armstrong from emily armstrong architects thank (laughs) you for coming on to build hatch and sharing your story yeah i certainly encourage people to check out particularly your gray street residence um it's it's a beauty so well done to you oh thank you so much aaron thanks for having me um absolutely Well, that was another Build Hatch episode with Emily Armstrong from EA Architects in Melbourne. As usual, if you know a hard worker having a go in the construction space or a building-related business personal product where you love what they are doing or selling, then please do get into contact with us and we'll be more than happy to tell their story and get behind their goods or services on the Build Hatch marketplace. Our team are busy rolling out independent sellers on buildhatch.com as we speak. So stay tuned for more and more products and services as they onboarded. As usual, please check out our Instagram page and other socials where we'll be able to learn more about our guests and some of the features of the work that we talk about. Have a great week and you'll hear me again on the airwaves next week. Thanks for listening to another episode of Build Hatch. You have experienced a Build Hatch developed production.